Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to go through every single audio effect built into DaVinci Resolve 17 with all of you. And so what you can expect from this tutorial is that I will try to briefly explain what each of the effects do. I'll show you the interface, try to show you how it sounds, and possibly explain a couple of the controls for what each can do. But for the sake of time, I'll try to keep it short and simple so that we can get to the end of this video without it taking an hour. Now, when it comes to audio effects inside of Resolve, you can find them over in the effects library on audio effects. And then when you wanna add one to a clip, you can simply left click on it, hold it, and then drag it onto your audio clip where you want that effect to apply. Now, one really important thing to know about audio effects is that if you go over to the Fairlight page in Resolve, you'll notice in the mixer, there's also the ability to add effects here. So if you click on the plus for one of your audio track mixers, so A1 is audio one, A2 is audio two, then you can see that all of the audio effects that you have available over on the effects library can also be added in here. The advantage of adding it into the audio track rather than the audio clip is that it will automatically apply the audio effect to every single clip that is in that track. So you only need to add it once. You don't need to keep adding it again and again for each audio clip. On the Fairlight tab, you can also see the effects library has audio effects here. So Fairlight, if you don't already know, is specifically meant for audio editing. So this is the page we're gonna stick on for the remainder of this video. So I'll just go top to bottom and we'll try to briefly explain what each one does now. So first we have the chorus effect. I'm gonna left click on my audio clip and for each of these clips, I've already set up uh, the effects. Once again, I'm going down the top in order. So the second one is gonna be de -esser. And uh, when you have your audio effects on your audio clips, you can go over to the effects page on the inspector and you'll be able to see all of your settings for the effects that are applied to that. So you can see I actually have two copies of the chorus effect. I'm gonna delete the one that's currently disabled. So clicking on the trash bin gets rid of it. If I wanna open up the graphical interface for these effects, then I can click on the settings icon on the top right. So before we talk about the chorus effect, let me go ahead and play this intentionally poorly recorded audio clip with no effects added on. So I'm gonna disable the chorus temporarily and let's go ahead and hit play. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So you can hear that there's a lot of background noise. I pause at random intervals. It's just pretty terrible, but we'll see how we can affect that audio clip using some of the effects in the audio library today. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn chorus back on. The idea of the chorus effect is that you create duplicated copies of the original sound, but it's not a simple echo effect because you can also throw on some modifications uh, to the original sound, such as changing the pitch, adjusting the frequency, or using the modulation tools in order to warp the sound further. There's also defaults that you can use for chorus. So I think it would be a good idea if we just go to the top here and let's try choosing wide dialogue, I suppose. So let's see how it sounds with these presets. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. I think the effect was a little bit light there. So one setting that we could choose to change would be the dry wet. If we shift this over towards wet, you can see that the amplitude or the height of the modulation goes way up if we increase the dry wet. So that's going to make the sounds a lot more obvious. So let's go back to the start and hit play. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. We can try one more. So let's go for the dramatic. So this is going to be very intense, I think. So let's go back to the start and hit play. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So that preset emphasizes it pretty well. It allows you to repeat the sounds in your audio clip, but also allowing you to modify how the repeated sounds are going to appear. So that if you have spoken audio and it sounds normal the first time, the second time it's gonna go through that modulation and it's gonna change the output of the sound. So the next audio effect, the de is meant to be there to remove sounds that are like hissing S's. So if you were to go into your microphone and make a sound like S, and then you wanted to get rid of some of the strength of that, then you would use the de -esser. So I'll go ahead and play it with the de sound effect, and then we'll choose to listen to S only so that we can hear what it's actually removing. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So one thing you can look at when you're using tools like the DS or in the D Hummer is that if it's actually working, if it's actually removing some of the volume at the specific frequency. 
So this would be roughly the frequency of the S sounds. And if it's actually removing anything, then you'll see this reduction bar jump up. Another way to check, of course, is to use listen to S only. So let's go ahead and do that. You'll notice that this is inverting so that we can hear what's being removed as opposed to what sticks around after the effect applies. So let's go ahead and listen. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So you can hear what's being removed. And in this case, since you can hear all of the spoken audio and not specifically the S sound, you'd probably want to make some adjustments. So because you can hear all of the spoken audio pass through the listen to S only, then that probably means you're picking up more than you actually want to remove. So if you want to save some time in adjusting the options down here at the bottom to get it just right, you can actually go into this top left menu. And once again, there's some presets. So if you're trying to target S sounds, then you choose male S. There's also male and female SH, which I would assume is for sh sounds as well. So let's try it with uh, male S and give it another shot. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. And now let's listen to the actual audio output. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So it's probably not a very good clip to use for this effect, but I think I do notice that with listen to S only, if I listen to this bit, let's go that the S sound on let's gets picked up a little bit more than the rest of the audio. So then kind of the general idea there. So I believe it is working properly. It's just that there's not a really harsh S sound being picked up by the audio. But anyway, if you're trying to remove S or sh sounds, then the de is for that. So uh, next we have the de-hummer. So for the de-hummer effect, I grabbed a clip of a electrical hum at 50 hertz. So the de-hummer effect specifically can target uh, 50 hertz or 60 hertz frequencies, and then try to remove background hums that you would get from electrical interference. So let's go ahead and turn off the hummer, and then you can just listen to the hum with no effects added on. Okay, so it's a really low background hum. It's a low frequency, right? If we turn on the de-hummer, and then we set the frequency to 50 hertz here, let's go ahead and see how it sounds, and then we'll listen to the hum only. So most of that hum just got removed. Let's listen to the hum only, and we can see what it's actually picking up on. So that bit right now that you just heard, that was all being removed by the de-hummer effect. So in addition to targeting 50 and 60 hertz, you can also set the frequency to variable mode, and then you can change the frequency if you need to target other frequencies. So if I change the frequency here, let's shift it to something way off. Then obviously all the audio comes back because we're hitting the wrong frequency. But the point is there, if for any reason you needed something that's not 50 or 60 hertz, you do have the ability to change it. Uh, so that's the D hummer in a nutshell. Let's go to the next effect. So this is going to be delay. So let's open up the interface for delay. So the delay effect allows you to replay audio after a certain delay or set period of time. And with the delay effect, that's indicated on a left channel and right channel basis. So you can actually have it play back differently, depending on if you're talking about your left speaker or your right speaker. Also for the delay effect, when it replays that audio, you can use a high cut and a low cut to cut away certain frequencies from the outer edges. So the really low frequencies and the really high frequencies. And if you cut that enough, then the replayed audio is going to only have a portion of the audio information of the original audio clip. Let's go ahead and play it now with the delay. Let's go ahead. Okay, so you can hear it's very echoey. So with a really high low cut, a lot of that background noise just gets cut away from the replay because those are low frequency sounds. So let's go ahead and hit play. And test out some. But if I lower the low cut back down to 20, let's go ahead and hit play. Audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Let's go ahead. But then you can hear more of that background noise comes back. So the high cut and low cut, their filters, they remove part of the audio from the playback delay. So it's a lot like having an echo where you can control the left and right channels individually. Okay, so next effect is the dialogue processor. 
So let's go ahead and open this up. What you'll see in the dialogue processor is actually six effects built into one. So we have the de-rumble and the de-esser. We've already talked about those. The de-rumble tries to remove low frequencies that shouldn't be in the audio recording. The de-esser removes S sounds and the sh sounds. So the de-pop filter is there to remove popping sounds. So if I was to go up to the microphone and do something like I do have a pop filter, maybe some of that still came through. So the deep pop there is to remove those really strong popping noises that would make your audio sound bad. Also the reason why you have a physical pop filter to begin with. The compressor will take the loudest sounds in your audio clip and level them off a little bit so that you won't have really loud, overly spiky uh, sound effects. Like for instance, if someone was to yell into the microphone uh, and that was way louder than your other audio, the compressor would kind of try to bring that more in line with your other audio if it goes above the threshold. So you see the threshold is set to negative 23 decibels right here. So the expander is kind of the opposite of the compressor. For the audio that is too quiet, it'll try to bring it up more in line with the rest of your audio. So sounds that are too quiet will be made a little bit louder. So for the exciter effect, I have to look this one up myself. SageAudio.com says that an exciter adds saturation to the signal frequencies in the higher ranges, 3K and up. So I guess for the frequencies where spoken dialogue is at, it tries to enhance and saturate those frequencies so that your spoken dialogue sounds crisper. And you'll notice that in the dialogue processor, there's both a female and a male option at the bottom here. As well, if you go to the top left, female and male voiceover. So depending on if your dialogue is being spoken by a male or female, you'll want to go in here and choose one of the presets. So for male, uh, you'll see the excite amount is at 0.21. And then for female, it's set to 0.11. So currently that's about my level of understanding for this particular effect. Uh, but if you throw on the dialogue processor and you put it in male voiceover and female voiceover, you'll notice how when you combine all of these six effects, it's going to obviously change how your dialogue sounds. So what I do notice sometimes when I throw on the dialogue processor to my speech is that some of these effects may actually pull away from your spoken audio. So for instance, uh, the DE rumble, when I leave that on the defaults of 75 Hertz, and then I run that through the audio I record with my microphone down here for videos like these, then having the frequency set to 75 can actually up take away from the overall quality of the output audio. So in some cases, you may want to disable some of these effects. You may want to change the frequencies and adjust it until it actually sounds just right for your microphone. So if you wanted to try to improve your audio a little bit, I would throw it onto the clip, uh, see how it sounds with the defaults, and then adjust some of the settings a little bit to try to tweak it. So at the end of the timeline here, I have audio recorded with this HyperX Quadcast microphone, much clearer than the intentionally bad clip I was using. And what I want to demonstrate with this here is that in some cases, you may not actually want to use every single one of these effects on your audio, since a lot of these effects, like D-Rumble or D-Esser, pull away from certain frequencies, lowering the audio volume on them. And then in those frequencies, there might be a little bit of the audio you actually wanted to keep, frequencies where you can actually hear yourself speaking. So if you pull away from those frequencies, it may actually make the audio sound a little less crisp at the end. So if I play this, and then I turn the dialogue processor on, hopefully you'll kind of see what I mean. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Okay, so that's the normal recording. And then with the dialogue processor, let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. And now when that was playing with the dialogue processor on, you could see with the DS effect that certain sounds were lowering a bit here. Uh, the D rumble also for the low frequencies, like hums, there's not really that, I don't really pick up on any of that in the recording with the original. So it may be unnecessary. I'm not sure if it's harming anything right here. With the DS or off, it may actually sound a little bit better. So I'll toggle that off. Let's go ahead and listen one more time. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Okay, and turning it back on. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. I would say it's a pretty tough call. Let's hit play and I'll keep toggling it on and off. Try to listen to it. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Okay, so with DSR on, let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. And then DSR off. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. I would say it's a tough call. It definitely doesn't require the DSR in this case to sound good, I would say. 
uh, maybe you had a bad recording and you just have a sound that just sounds way overkill. And then you do need the de for that because it sounds terrible. But with the dialogue processor, I would say this is really the kind of tool where you just need to go in here, uh, try turning some on and off, see if it makes it sound better or worse. A lot of times, especially lately, I just don't even use the dialogue processor. When I was recording with this headset microphone, I used it a lot more uh, because the audio from the headset microphone was less quality, I would say. So I found that I got better results when I turned on the dialogue processor. But in any case, it's a really handy tool for using voiceovers, and I definitely would recommend giving it a shot and seeing how it affects your dialogue if you're doing any kind of voiceover recording. Hopefully you guys are still keeping up with me and all of this. I, I know this is going to be a long video. Uh, one thing I will note is that I'm going to put uh, timestamps in the description for this video, and if you're watching on YouTube, then you can also navigate from timestamp to timestamp. So if you want to look at a specific effect, go ahead and look at the timestamps and see where that effect might be. Or if you're still in it for the long haul, then just, you know, keep watching to the end. But just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, so the next effect is distortion. So how I would best describe the distortion effect would be to take your audio and to simulate running it through really old audio technology, like an old phone, a loudspeaker, one of the ones that people talk into when they want to get attention of, like, a hundred people in a crowd, I don't know, out at some festival or something, or really old military communication systems, uh, stuff like that. So the basic idea there is that with older technology, the audio that you would put into the microphone doesn't come out the same as it was spoken. It's not a perfect recording or a translation of that audio, so it ends up sounding a little bit distorted. So that's the idea of the distortion effect. And uh, you have a bunch of options here at the top to change how your audio is going to sound. So if you want it to be distorted, you can make it sound like a megaphone. You can go to the drop down menu and choose megaphone. So let's play how it sounds without audio distortion again. Let's go ahead. OK, so you probably know that sound at this point. Let's put it through the megaphone defaults. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So pretty cool. It makes it sound totally different. It's not crisp, clean audio anymore. Not that that original clip was very clean to begin with. But you can see how it gets warped. In this case, a lot of the high frequencies get cut. The low frequencies get cut as well. So the sounds get condensed down to very specific frequencies. So with the distortion effect, you have two settings down here for distortion. You have destroy on the right, which is considered the stronger effect. So I guess visually you can see how it has an immediate sharp drop off of the signal level. But when you put it on the left mode uh, distortion, then there's actually a ramp between these two signal levels. So let's put the megaphone into the distortion mode. Let's go ahead. And then back in destroy mode. And test out. So hopefully you can hear there how the destroy mode is just a stronger effect and then the uh, distortion mode on the left it still sounds a little bit more like the original. So I suppose that's about my level of understanding there for the distortion effect. Uh, let's move on to echo. So the echo effect is pretty simple to understand. You're repeating the original audio in a sense on a loop until it completely fades out. So every time it plays, it's going to be quieter and quieter until you can't hear it anymore. So let's go ahead and play this back with the echo effect. Let's go let's ahead, go ahead, let's go ahead and test out, test out, test out, test out some, some audio effects. Audio 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 effects. Audio effects. Hopefully you could hear there how each time it plays back the spoken audio, that it gets quieter and quieter over time. So with echo, we also have some presets. So let's try a large hall here and we'll go back to the start and hit play. Let's, let's go, go ahead, ahead and test, test out, out some audio, audio effects, effects inside, inside of DaVinci Resolve, Resolve 17. 17. So with these settings on echo, it actually ends up turning out to be a lot like reverb, which we'll talk about later, uh, simulating being in a large room. Let's try one of the other presets. So swirling close, sure. Let's go Let's ahead go. and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. I suppose one thing to note about the echo effect here is that you can customize the feedback delay for the left and right channels to be different. So if you want it to play back at slightly different times on the left ear or the right ear, if you're wearing a headset like this, um, then you could do that with the feedback delay. But yeah, in general, just repeating the audio over time. And you also have the ability to filter out the repeated values if you want it to only replay specific frequencies. So let's close that and move on. 
So next we're looking at the flanger effect and when we actually hit play, what you'll notice is that the frequencies are going to bounce around from left to right. So it'll be alternating between high frequencies and low frequencies and the repeated process of doing that, basically creating like a spring, is going to give you a very specific kind of sound. So let's go ahead and hit play. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve. So you can see how with that spring effect on the frequency, it causes the audio to kind of wobble and how it sounds, and that gives you that flanger effect sound. There's also some presets for this effect as well. So we could use the flanger effect, drop down to Robo Voice, and then if we play that through our audio. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Then I suppose we end up with something like a robo voice effect. So um, the idea of the flanger is basically if you want the frequency to keep bouncing from low to high frequencies and rapid succession, and then kind of giving your voice a little bit of echo, then that is one tool you can use. So next up, the Folly Sampler. So I've never really touched the Folly Sampler, but according to the DaVinci Resolve documentation, uh, that would be like the DaVinci Resolve 16 reference manual. But what the idea of the Folly Sampler is, is that while you're playing back your video, you can put the Folly Sampler into record mode, and then you have sound effects mapped to certain keys. And I suppose those key mappings could be linked to an external device. But while you're playing back your video and you want to add some sound effects to it, you would listen to the right moments that you want to add in specific sound effects. You would press the key and then it would add that sound effect to the recorded track. So the Folly Sampler track. And so it basically becomes a way that you can add sound effects into your video and then play back the sound effects you need at the right audio cues. So I suppose the idea is that rather than having to manually drop every single audio effect into the timeline where you need it on an audio track, you just click on the you just click on the keys to play the sound effect where you want it to be and then it will all be on this recorded track for the folly sampler at precisely the right moment and one of the downsides of having to manually drop in sound effects to a timeline is that you can only have one audio clip playing at a specific audio timeline at once so if you needed three or four sound effects to overlap each other at the same time then you'd have to put them all on separate audio tracks which might mean that you have to also duplicate the audio effects to multiple audio tracks at the same time. But if you were recording it with the Folly Sampler, then I suppose all of those pressed audio buttons that correspond to audio effects would all go on the same audio track and the same recording, and you'd only need to apply your effects once. So once again, I've never used the Folly Sampler, so that's just kind of what I got out of the documentation for what this is all about. By the way, if you are interested in using the Folly Sampler, the guide does seem to have some steps for how to set it up, so you could check that out. Okay, so next we have an easy one, the Frequency Analyzer. So when you open up the Frequency Analyzer, you'll notice there's no controls here, really. You can set it to full spectrum mode, uh, which is the default, and that will show all of the frequencies from 20 hertz to 24,000 hertz. Uh, you can also show specifically low frequencies, mid-range frequencies, and high frequencies. So the same stuff you would see on the full spectrum, just only showing you a bit of it at once. Now, you won't actually see anything on this graph until you hit play. What it's going to be showing you is the frequencies at which your audio is playing at. What it's going to show you is the volume for each of the frequencies that your audio is playing at. So basically which frequencies in your audio are very loud and which ones are quiet or have no noise at all in them. So let's go ahead and hit play on our audio clip and we can see uh, which frequencies have loud volume and which ones are quiet. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So this tool is purely for analysis, but I could see it being useful if you need to lower down some frequencies because there's a lot of background noise or something like that. So you could see uh, what frequencies are loud and which ones like way up here don't really have any noise at all. Okay, so the next one, LFE filter, another one I've never really touched. So my understanding here is that if you are setting up your audio for your video, you may have a surround sound setup. And in that case, part of the audio, the really low frequencies would be dedicated to a low frequency channel. So that's what it's talking about here, LFE channels. You can see it peaks out here a little after 240 hertz. E channel, because you were... So if you had an LFE channel, you were trying to set up surround sound for a video or a movie, then you can use the LFE filter in here to 
target a certain frequency cutoff, and then you can trim some of the audio information from the final audio output for that low frequency channel. So once again, though, I'm basically getting that kind of information off Google, so I've never really had to use that one. So the next effect we have is the limiter. So with the limiter, you have this line and everything that sits above it is going to show blue on this graph. So what it's going to do is that any audio that is too loud, basically whatever shown in the blue zone, is going to be brought back down. It's going to have a reduction in its audio volume. So in a sense, it's a cap on the maximum volume of your audio for the attached clip or track. So let's go ahead and show it with the limiter in this zone, and then I'll decrease the threshold for the limiter so that more of the audio gets reduced. Let's go ahead and test. Okay, so right there, most of the audio is still there. There's not a lot of reduction, but if we lower the threshold down here, something like negative 15 decibels. Let's go ahead and test out some. Then you can see how more of the audio is going to rise above that threshold line. And as such, more audio is going to be reduced and it's gonna be reduced further to bring it in line with that limiter. So that's the limiter effect. Now we can move on to the meter. So the meter isn't so much an effect as it is another tool for analyzing your audio. So you might notice in the mixer in the bottom right hand corner for both the edit page, but also in this section for the Fairlight page, that there is a meter right here. So when you're playing your audio, it's gonna show you the volume level that's playing on each audio track or the main output. So if I hit play here, Let's then you'll see how the audio levels rise here, showing the volume in that audio track, and it'll show you how high it rises, how loud the audio is. That is, bas that is basically what the meter does, except this meter, you can move around on the screen. You could put it on a second monitor if you wanted to, there's also a couple options here, so you can increase or decrease the width and height of that meter. And one of the main differences is that you can attach it to a specific clip. So if you attach it to a single audio clip, that meter will only ever read anything if that audio clip is playing. But if you look at the meter for the track, then any audio clip on the track is going to make the meter register um, some audio. So if for any reason you needed a floating meter to put somewhere um, in order to watch the audio on a clip or a track, then that would be how you can do it with the meter effect. Okay, the next effect we have is modulation. Uh, one of the things you'll note about it is that with modulation, you're basically taking the original audio and then you're putting it through a new wave that's going to modify how it sounds. For, so for instance, sine, triangle, saw waves. So with the modulator wave shapes, it's going to cause the sound on your audio clip to bounce around going up and down. And then there's a few properties that those waves can affect, including frequency and filter for uh, when you want to shave off the low and high frequencies of what gets put in the audio output. So you can see right here in the top left menu, right now I have it selected at Doppler effect. So it's meant to simulate the sound of an object moving past you, um, such as a car driving by. But there's many other modulation based sound effects you can get from this. So we can go ahead and play this one real quick. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside. So you could hear how the sound kind of phased out and then came back in really strongly. Uh, let's switch to something else like exterminate. So you can see here that the pattern for this preset is completely different. Uh, let's go ahead and play it. Let's go ahead. And so kind of a robotic sound there. So the wah wah effect here, uh, it's going to be bouncing up and down like wah 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 wah. Let's go ahead and hit play. And test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So in a nutshell, it would be a pretty handy tool if you're trying to warp how your audio sounds. And it doesn't necessarily need to be spoken vocal audio. It can really be any audio effect that you just want to modify by adding on a modulation. Um, so let's close that out and we'll jump to our next one now. So the multi-band compressor. So let's go ahead and open this one up. Uh, when we're talking about bands here, we're talking about frequency bands. So the multi-band compressor here has four bands. So you can see the low frequency, the low to mid frequency, mid to high, and then the high frequencies. Uh, so these bands, you can adjust where their starting and ending points are. So if I want to take this 80 line, I can shift this over to the left. So now our uh, low frequency band is smaller and the band two, the low to mid frequency band has been expanded. 
so the reason we might have bands is that we can adjust those different sections of the frequency graph individually. So you can see that we have threshold and gain. So once again, tools for adjusting the volume up or down, depending on if the audio has met a certain threshold or not. So in this case, with this setup, uh, basically we're taking the gain way down for the loud sounds on the left, on the very low frequencies and the very high frequencies. Um, since the spoken dialogue usually ends up somewhere around here, it is one tool that you could try out for some noise reduction. Let's go ahead and show how this is gonna sound. Let's go ahead. All right, and now I'll disable the multiband compressor and you can hear the difference as uh, the audio in the low and high frequencies comes back in. And test out some. Okay, yeah, so hopefully you can hear massive difference in the volume there. Yeah, so the ability to move the bands really easily is probably the most flexible part of this tool. So if you need to target specific frequencies and raise and lower the volume there, then this would be a really cool tool for doing that kind of thing. So next up, noise reduction. I know I just mentioned how you could use the multi-band compressor for noise reduction, but there's technically a specific noise reduction tool as well. So the way that this tool works though is quite different. You, in essence, try to teach the tool uh, what frequencies you want to try to reduce. And you do that by toggling on learn mode and then playing back the portion of your audio clip where you think has bad background noise. And then that's gonna generate a frequency graph. And then for that graph, it'll try to remove it when you have the noise reduction enabled. So in this case, you can see that the graph's picking up a lot of low frequency sounds. So that's in general what it's gonna try to target and remove from the audio. So right now I have it in learn mode. I will go ahead and replay the first half second of this audio so that we can regenerate this graph. So you can see there, like while the audio was playing, it shifted around the graph to kind of match whatever sounds it heard. So if I disable learn mode now, then I can go to the start here, I can hit play, and it will remove sounds that are similar to what it heard before uh, based on the frequency. So let's go ahead and hit play here. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Okay, and once again, playing it with no noise reduction on. Let's go ahead. So this can be a useful tool. One of the things you might've heard though, is that um, because some of the sounds that were around the first half second did kind of fall into that vocal speech area, it does detract a little bit from the spoken dialogue as well. So using this can remove background noise, but if there's a lot of background noise and you try to remove too much of it using tools like this, then it can cause the dialogue to sound worse as well as part of the audio gets taken out from the speech. So that's why it's always better if you can get a clean recording from the beginning so that you need a minimal use of tools like this and your audio can still sound good uh, while keeping most of the background audio out. Okay, so next up, uh, phase meter. So this is another analysis tool. The idea here is that if the phase meter is to the right when you're playing back your audio clip, then it is in sync. If it's around zero, then it is not receiving a signal. And if it's to the left, then it's out of sync. So this tool is just for checking if it's in sync. So I'll go ahead and hit play here and we'll be able to see uh, that the audio clip is roughly speaking in sync because it's gonna be over here on the right. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Next up, we have the pitch tool. So I would imagine half of all of you watching, if not more, have played around with pitch at some point in time. You record something and then you just make someone into a chipmunk. So that is basically the idea of the pitch tool. You can increase or lower the pitch on a sound or someone's voice. So if you have a really low pitch, you lower the semitones here. It's gonna make the sound or someone's voice sound a lot deeper like this. Let's go ahead. And if you raise the semitones, it's going to make someone's voice a lot more high pitched, a little bit more squeaky. So let's go ahead and hit play with a plus six semitones. And test out some. And as you can see, it also affects the background noise, of course, too. So you do have to keep that in mind. It's not just going to be for the spoken audio. Next, we have the reverb effect. So as you might be able to guess, looking at this length, height and width shape, basically a box indicating a gigantic room. You can see this room, the concert hall has a room size of 393 meters squared, 
quite large. The idea here is that you're trying to simulate uh, whatever was being spoken, a speech, you know, whatever, um, being in a very large room. Because when you have a large room, you tend to get a lot of this reverb um, sound bouncing off the walls and flowing back through the air. Since in large open rooms, when you speak audio out, uh, it tends to not get absorbed very well. So it could bounce around in an auditorium and kind of have a little bit of an echoey effect. So let's try this out with the concert hall here. Let's go ahead and test out. And there's of course other options here as well. We could try a bathroom. Some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So if you were just speaking a voiceover into a mic and you wanted to fake that being recorded in a very large room, then trying one of these presets here could be a good way to do that. Okay, next up, the soft clipper. So a lot of the other tools we've talked about so far are similar to this. Basically, if the audio is above a certain threshold, we want to bring that back down, have a reduction in the audio volume for those loud sounds. The difference with the soft clipper is that we can add a soft curve shape to it. So if we have this shape all the way on hard, then what that means is that anything above that threshold is going to be brought in line with this. Even if it's very close to the threshold or far away from the threshold, it's basically going to get that same reduction to this hard line. But if we turn the shape towards soft, you can see how it's a gradual curve now. So the very loud sounds are going to be brought back towards this line. But the stuff that is close to the threshold is going to be reduced in a more smooth pattern rather than just a harsh drop off to that line. Okay, so let's lower the threshold down here quite a lot so that the noise reduction is very obvious. We'll try it with a soft shape and then we'll do it with the hard shape. Let's go ahead and test out. Okay, and now on the hard shape with that sharp point. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects. So that's basically the idea there. If you wanted noise reduction to be more gradual rather than a sharp drop off, then the soft clipper is a tool you can use for that. Next, we have the stereo fixer. So if you're recording audio, uh, your left and right channels may not match up perfectly. So if that is the case, then you might want to take your original audio input and increase or decrease the gain on the left and right channels until the two match up so that you have roughly the same volume on your left speaker and your right speaker or your left and right earmuffs on you. And then increase or decrease the volume on your left and right audio channels until they roughly match up. Obviously, of course, if you can record it and it was correct initially before you actually need to fix it, then that's ideal. But the stereo fixer is there just in case it happens. So let's go ahead and uh, play this here. So right now I have the right channel at negative 13.3 decibels. That's going to put them very far apart in terms of their volume, but you can get the idea here. Let's go ahead and test out. So you can see how the original audio was roughly the same on the left and right audio channels, though not perfect. So now I uh, put them further apart by lowering the right one by negative 13.3. But if you wanted them to match up, probably more likely what we would want to do is to possibly push the right channel up by about one decibel. We could try that. So let's hit space. Let's go ahead and test out some. And we can see that that's even too much there. So in this case, even though the audio sounds pretty bad because uh, it was recorded with a laptop built in microphone, the left and right audio volume are more or less the same because the microphones are roughly in the same spot right by the webcam. Let's go to the start here and play it one more time with 0.4. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So that is pretty close, I suppose. Uh, really, you'd probably use this tool more if there was a 5 or 10 decibel difference on one of the channels, if it was really obvious that there was a difference. So we can move on. So next up, stereo width. So when you record your audio, and there's not one single audio channel, which would be mono audio, then you can have a spread, a left right channel spread for basically where your audio is going to play back. So stereo here is referring to two channel audio. So that means left and right. And then in the, in the middle here, I presume that M is for mono, as in it's just going to output the same 
on both sides of your speakers, even if you have two of them. So what you can do here with your audio is to increase the spread between your left and right audio channels or to shift them back down towards mono. So if you make it zero width or pure mono, it's gonna play all of the sound back equally on both your left and your right speakers. So let's go ahead and hit play here. Let's go ahead and test out some and what you might notice is that the audio volume on the output is the same because it's playing the same audio back on both sides of your speaker. It's mono audio. So let's increase the width here. And then this is going to take the recorded audio, which normally uh, would have a spread here, something like this, kind of like a pizza slice. And it's going to shift whatever's on the left further to the left and whatever's on the right further to the right so that that part of the audio becomes much more focused on the left channel and less on the right channel. And then the right channel audio becomes more focused on the right and plays less on the left. So let's go ahead and try that now. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So with this audio clip, it's a little hard to tell. The laptop, when I was recording this audio clip, has a microphone array, but the microphones are literally about this far from each other. So the left-right audio is almost the same to begin with. There's only a little bit of difference between the left and right. Uh, so you can kind of see that indicated here, because even when I double the spread, the audio output is roughly the same. OK, so let's go to the next tool, Surround Analyzer. So the Surround Analyzer here we can use for a couple purposes. Uh, one would be to figure out the microphone pattern. So uh, there's different ways that microphones can pick up on sounds. Uh, one of the common ways uh, for doing stuff like videos like these using a standard plug and play microphone would be to put it in cardioid pattern. And that's also the pattern that the laptop microphones I keep talking about are using. I'll go ahead and hit play here. Let's so uh, this is basically a cardioid pattern where everything is focused in front and the sounds that would be behind the microphone are very de-emphasized back here. So if you see LS and RS down here, that would be referring to the sound behind the microphone. And then L is left channel, R, R is right channel, and then C is the center right in the middle. So it's very forward focused in its sound, and you can see that here. Another thing to understand about this could be that if you're using a surround sound system, which speakers are going to be playing uh, the sound basically. So if you have the surround sound speakers that are towards the back, those aren't going to be getting too much of the volume here because of the cardioid pattern for this recorded sound. Mostly it's going to be focused on the left front, the right front, and the center speakers. Okay, so that brings us to the last effect, and that is the vocal channel. So I have been liking this tool a lot lately because it gives you three useful tools for adjusting the audio levels of your clips. Uh, so you may notice that this is focused on vocals because your spoken audio is mostly going to fall into this kind of range here. So the high pass is going to allow you to cut away low frequencies. Anything that falls below the high pass cutoff point is going to be drastically reduced here. So you can see um, this area of the graph is being brought down from its base decibel line down to very low volumes. And we can adjust where that high pass cutoff line is here. Uh, you'll notice it's a soft cutoff line. It does not immediately go to zero, but it gradually does as the curve goes towards the bottom. So with the equalizer, you can adjust the left sides of the curve and the right sides as well by changing the frequencies here. So once again, it's kind of a soft cutoff point. The gain dials can be used for controlling how much audio is going to be removed over here. But basically, it just kind of comes down to adjusting your frequencies and the amount of gain you want to remove until you get the audio to sound nicely. And then, of course, you would listen back and make sure it doesn't hurt your vocals too much. You can also boost the middle if you want to, uh, but be careful. Don't push your audio past that zero decibel maximum the audio can play back at, or it's going to distort your sound, make it sound really bad. You're going to lose a lot of audio information. In fact, I wouldn't say I know the perfect volume level, but I would not put my own volume close to zero. I'd probably keep it more at about negative uh, 10 decibels for when it's playing back in the timeline. You can boost it if for some reason you need to. Maybe it was too quiet when you recorded it. And then the compressor here is going to reduce audio that goes above a certain threshold. So we can see with the compressor, we have this original grayed outline for where if the audio was above the threshold, where it would have been originally. And then the light blue line here is where it gets brought down to. So anything below the threshold is left alone, but anything above it 
is going to be compressed down to be more in line with the rest of our audio. So using these in conjunction, you can improve the sound of your audio, possibly remove a little of the background noise, bringing your loudest vocals down a little more in line with your clip. And if you need to, you can boost the vocal frequencies so that it sounds louder compared to the background noise. And of course, you can remove both the low and high frequencies. So you just got to like play around with that a little bit. So let's go ahead and play it with the vocal channel on, and then we'll play it with it off. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. Of course, as you saw there, you can always adjust basically any of the properties for effects while you're playing it back. And that might not be a bad idea because then you can hear things back in real time. Uh, anyway, let's play it back without the vocal channel on. Let's go ahead and test out some audio effects. And then I turned it on and you can see how it makes a drastic difference. A lot of the background noise gets cut off from this high pass. So yeah, vocal channel is another tool you can use for improving your audio and removing some of the noise that is undesirable and focusing in on what you want to keep, which is that spoken audio at a consistent level. So that brings us to the end of the video. Things I want to point out uh, once again is that having audio effects can be helpful. But uh, first off, if you can record your audio as crisply and as well spoken as possible, first time before you actually put it in a video editor or audio editor program like this, uh, the better it's going to be in the end. Audio effects can help a little bit, but they can't really fix terribly recorded audio. And that's why I kept using this bad test clip and this video to illustrate that although you can remove some of the background noise, a badly recorded audio clip is still going to sound pretty bad in the end. So use audio effects where appropriate, but try not to rely on them if possible. If you can record your audio nicely the first time, that is going to be ideal and uh, probably worth investing in a decent microphone, I would say. So that's going to be it for this video. If you stuck around to the end, thank you very much for watching. I know this has been a really long video. I hope all of you learned a lot. I've been Chris. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my future video content.